one of the things um, that has really stuck with me in this whole um, conversation, debate, dialogue over uh, abortion is how I think we have failed to learn from history. Hmm. Every time that a group of people has engaged in defining who is human, who isn't, or according greater status of human dignity for one human being over another, for whatever reason, it's ultimately resulted in discrimination, atrocities, even genocide. Right. So we have it with what the Nazis did with the Jews. They dehumanized them, and that paved the way for what we saw with the concentration camps and, and all the evil that transpired there and all the abuses and discrimination that occurred prior to all of that. We see that in our own nation's history with slavery, where uh, blacks were considered not human. They were likened unto um, to beasts. As Frederick Douglass said to Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he said, uh, if it were between uh, the crocodile and the white man, uh, I'm for the, uh, and, and the black man, or, sorry, if we're between the crocodile and the black man, I'm for the black man. So the, the idea being that somehow the slaves are somewhere between an animal and a human being, but not quite a human being. And that justified their enslavement, the brutality, the abuse, right? And then of course we had the three fifths compromise where for purposes of the law, you know, we would, we would consider each slave a three-fifths of a person, not quite afforded the, the dignity of being fully human so as to justify our, the continued enslavement and oppression of them. Hmm. And of course, we have apartheid in South Africa. Horrible. Right, where, where blacks were treated essentially like no better than animals. No, non-human. Yeah, exactly. And so any time you engage in an argument that a person is less than human and therefore it justifies whatever I'm going to do to them that might be injurious or harmful, you are treading on very thin ice. And that's what essentially what we've done with this issue of abortion is we've said the fetus isn't human or isn't as human or doesn't shouldn't have the same rights as the mother because the mother's human rights prevail over the fetus's human rights that's where we get into, I think, the, the issue that we see where it, it, it results in, uh, frankly, the murder of, of, of human beings. So um, I think we have to have a lot more humility as it relates to that issue and how we talk about it. Well, she also mentioned she went through kind of a personal discovery of intellectual integrity, mm -hmm. which isn't something that can be imposed on someone. But I really liked that she started asking the follow-up questions, which is a process of academic discovery, or we go through that in business too, almost like a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths of my argument? What are the weaknesses? One of the things that I hear you saying is it's kind of like the discussion that started a, a national um, discussion, which was asked on the, in a Senate hearing, what is a woman? And all of a sudden, it's almost like everybody's minds went blank. Well, we don't know. <laughs> the question that you're asking is, what is a human? And all of these people seem to be pretending that they don't know. Well, we don't, we don't know. What is a human? What is a human? All through history, what you're saying is, when we have misanswered that question, we have committed human rights atrocities. And then we have deemed after the fact that was a human rights atrocity. We'd better, better to err on the side of thinking that things that are human are human, that things that look human or So we have all kinds of academic discourse on this about the other, something that is other than us, rather than thinking of it different and dehumanizing it, we should humanize it. If we don't dignify the civil rights of people other than us, then nobody's civil rights are respected. That's just a basic civil rights principle. 
one question to start with is what is a human? The other question to start with that I thought was really interesting that Marjorie said is what is it? If it is not an organ or an appendix or something that's already part of my body, what is it? I think we actually agree on more than we disagree. So when I get into conversations with intellectually curious people on the spectrum from pro-life to pro-choice, not just angry people of political disposition. One of the questions to ask is, you know, they'll say, do you believe life begins at conception? And so rather than answering it, I will ask, do dead things grow? Simple question. We all know this. We learned this in elementary school. And the answer is no. Dead things don't grow. Okay. Then we both agree that it is life because at conception, it starts to grow. So it's not dead. Whatever it is, as we begin that intellectually curious discussion, it is alive. Something else that I thought was curious that I discovered in my mom journey, three of the it's were male. I am not male. So the thing living and growing in me that is alive is completely different than me. It's not just me. It's not my pancreas, my appendix, my stomach. It is something alive and different from me that has a life of its own that I cannot possibly create on my own. And so I really appreciate what you're saying that we have to understand the dignity and respect and there's something separate. The other thing that I think you picked up on that I'd like you to talk about further, because I know we had these discussions when we were in law school, I think it's really dangerous under the Equal Protection Clause when you elevate one person's rights to have choice over everybody else's. When all of a sudden the mother, that's what she said the most dangerous part of this debate right now, is the mother has supreme choice. Well, that's, that's, there, 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 when you're dealing with the Equal Protection Clause, and not to get too technical, but I mean, at some point you're gonna have a hierarchy of, of rights on some level. Um, however, in this particular case, it's essentially a might makes right exactly. argument, right? And uh, Marjorie kind of alluded to that in the sense that she was saying like, it's the people who have a voice who are being heard, but what about the silent, nascent child in the womb who has no voice? Well, because they have no voice or ability to defend or speak for themselves, they're not heard. Right. Right. And so the people with a voice are the people who have the power. And we see that outside the context of the pro-life uh, and abortion debate. We see that in any political issue. It's the people who have the strongest voices, the most influential voices who usually ultimately win the day. Well, one of the things that concerns me and feel free to answer this as a dad is the dad has no say in the parental rights of this child. But if the mom chooses to have the child, the dad has no say in having to pay for this child. And so there's this really interesting tension in the law of the pre nine months responsibility and authority and decision making power that the dad has. And then the 18 years that follows those nine months of the responsibility and authority and decision making power that dad is responsible for. But he has at this point in time under our law, no say in what happens before, which I think is a really interesting paradox in what we would call family law and the equality of the parents in that choice. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that is that is an, uh, an issue and a problem. And I, but I also think as, just as a man, w I have to come from the perspective of why do women feel like they're, they have to make that choice That's and be that position? Fair. It's because as, as men, uh, we've, failed or refused to live up to our responsibilities for that child yes um in in the mother's womb right I'll, and so uh, i'm not saying that's all men but i'm saying that culturally that that has become in increasingly the case i mean a lot of the time it's it's the man who's advocating for uh, yeah, the abortion right. and, and not not the woman because he doesn't want to take responsibility for the child absolutely right Good so point. uh so there has to be some ownership of, of of that responsibility. 
I think we had it right when we didn't allow for abortion and we said the man and the woman both have responsibility for the child in that mm -hmm. womb from uh, from womb to tomb. Mm -hmm. And and so I would love to see us get back to that place where life is honored and cherished above mm -hmm. all else because every right that we have flows from that right to life and to the extent that we undermine or degrade the dignity and the sanctity of any life, we degrade the dignity and the sanctity of every life when we make every life more vulnerable. So anyway, it was a great conversation and uh, uh, really appreciate the work she's done and is doing and uh, appreciate all those mothers out there. And, um, right. and God bless the mothers who went through the difficult decision and did have abortions. May they find Mm -hmm. uh, comfort and, and, and peace and, and healing because I'm sure many of them are dealing with a lot of pain as a result. That's right. Amen. Amen.